It is June 11, 1979. The space station Skylab has just entered the Earth's atmosphere and is hurtling down toward Earth. NASA has predicted and aimed the space station for a point 1300 kilometers or about 800 miles south-southeast of Cape Town in southern Africa. However, due to a small calculation error, the station is not quite going where they expected and is instead now tumbling towards a small town in southwest Australia. The year is 1972. NASA just launched the Apollo 17 mission to the moon. This would be the seven manned mission to the moon in just three years. Moon exploration was becoming everyday occurrences, becoming trivial. So the next logical step for NASA was to begin to prepare for a more permanent human presence in space. At that point in time, the longest any human has been outside of the atmosphere was about two weeks. So NASA wanted to explore what happened, could the human body even survive for extended periods of time in microgravity outside the Earth. So they decided they would build a space station called Skylab. What NASA did in order to cut down on developer time was that they repurposed the third stage of a Saturn V rocket. Now that they didn't need to go all the way to the moon, they didn't actually need the third stage. So instead of filling it up with fuel, they just built a space station inside the fuel tank and said, there we go. They then used a Apollo um, command and service modules for transporting um, astronauts or crew um, up to the space station. The space station was fitted with a solar observatory, a docking port, an airlock, and on May 14th, 1973, Skylab was launched uncrewed into orbit. It was planned to be followed by a crew the following day. However, things went quite badly during the launch. The micrometeorite shield was torn away from Skylab during launch. And as it was ripped away from the station, it also tore off the heat shield and one of the solar panels or solar arrays and the other array got jammed in the process so it couldn't unfold. So instead of that mission that was supposed to send up a crew, that would now have to be a repair mission. So the NASA engineers, they got to work at figuring out how they could salvage this. How could they repair and get Skylab back on track? It took them 11 days and on May 25th, the Skylab 2 was launched with three astronauts towards the space station. They began the repair, they managed to get the, um, the solar array unstuck, so they at least had one of them active. And they created like a tarp, essentially you have these like heat blankets, you know, these thin foil heat blankets. It, was, it looked like one of those that you just spread out over this, the space station where the heat shield was missing. Um, it's, it looked quite fun, a bit janky, um, but apparently it worked. The crew actually ended up staying at Skylab for 28 days, which at that point was the record for the longest period of time anyone had stayed in space. Following the Skylab 2 mission, both Skylab 3 and Skylab 4 each added an additional month to the time that they stayed, with Skylab 3 staying for two months and Skylab 4 then staying for three months. The main purpose of Skylab was to investigate how the human body evolved when exposed to zero G or what's called microgravity for an extended period of time. As I said, they also have a solar um, observatory on board, so they took some amazing pictures of, uh, of the sun and really advanced the, um, the science of, of solar physics. Um, and they also did with some, some like material science, like how could you, could you weld in space? How was it to weld in space? Could you actually build things? Um, fluid mechanics, uh, how did, did that act when it was in, in zero gravity? All those things were things that they were um, investigating and that uh, was part of the Skylab missions. After the Skylab 4 mission returned on February 8, 1974, Skylab was not in a good state. One of the gyros has already failed and another one began to show signs of wear and tear that it might be due to fail pretty soon, um, meaning that they were pretty much only down to one reliable gyro on the space station. They still had enough food, water, oxygen for at least another two months that they left on the station and they also left the, uh, the front hatch unlocked so people could get up there. And the plan was that Skylab 5 would not only boost Skylab up into a higher orbit as its orbit would decay over time, 
but they will also perform maintenance and repair on the station, utilizing a lot of the knowledge that was gained doing the Skylab 2, 3 and 4 missions. However, probably due to budget constraints, Skylab 5 was cancelled or at least postponed. At the time, it was expected that Skylab could stay in orbit without being boosted for at least another six years. That means they were expecting it to stay up there until 1980. And the plan was to wait for the space shuttle that was at the time still under development to send up what's called like a space talk, a uh, small spacecraft that you could latch on to, uh, to Skylab and would then boost it up into a, uh, into a higher orbit. However, NASA wasn't so lucky as due to a unexpected increase in solar activity, the Earth's atmosphere was heated up ever so slightly, but it's enough that it would expand as things do when they get heated up and as the atmosphere was expanded ever so slightly, it also meant that it would increase the air resistance on Skylab, meaning that the orbit would decay faster than expected. So the expected re-entry date for Skylab was moved up to 1979, so one year earlier. This was still fine, it was still within the expected um, completion day for the space shuttle, which then later got delayed. So finally, towards the end of 1978, NASA gave up on saving Skylab. They just couldn't finish the space shuttle in time, and the increased solar activity just meant that it was decaying faster than expected. So all NASA really could do now was to try and ensure that Skylab would come down in a place where it wouldn't hurt anyone and where it wouldn't do any damage to any buildings. They could kind of control the re-entry, they didn't really have any engines on board, but they did still have that one working gyro and they also had the um, ability to turn the space station. So by either turning it like sideways into its uh, orbit direction or facing into the orbit direction. They could kind of control how quickly the orbit was decaying. It's not the most accurate, but they could kind of try. And they were aiming for this point um, south-southeast of Cape Town. And they used this point because if you look at the orbit that Skylab would take, this gives them the most amount of water both before and after. So should they overshoot or undershoot a little bit compared to their calculations, there was a good chance they would still splash down somewhere over the ocean and thereby minimizing the risk of hitting people or buildings. But due to just a 4% calculation error, it meant that instead of the space station was heading towards the desired splashdown location, it was now heading towards the southwest Australian town Esperance. Back then in 79, my guess it is probably had a population of a few thousand inhabitants. Today it's up to like 12,000. But it is a very rural area. This far between the houses is not that densely populated. So luckily, despite a lot bigger chunks of the space station made it all the way to the ground than NASA had initially expected. It didn't hit anyone. No one got hurt. There were no reported major property damage. There was no buildings were completely destroyed or anything major like that. Now, this whole event was a massive media hype wherever making merchandise and people were selling these like um, Skylab protection um, caps that people could basically buy and it was a whole joke with that there would be like it would work guaranteed or if you did get hit by Skylab you would get your money back or something. I mean there was a lot of media attention around this and there were even bounties out for the first people who could bring a piece of Skylab to various news agencies in the US. Um, there was a lot of attention on this. The fallout from the from this whole crash was well minor. As a bit of a joke, Australia fined NASA a four hundred dollar fine for littering. Um, today's money that would be around seventeen hundred dollars. The fine was actually ignored. NASA never paid it. Only a few months after the uh, after the crash, the Australian um, government also like wrote off that fine as they wouldn't expect it to be paid. It was really meant as a joke. That was until 2009 when an American radio host called Scott Barley uh, collected donations from his listeners to actually go and, and, and pay that fine on behalf of NASA. And the, the donations were successful, he got the money, he went to Australia and he paid the fine in full. However, should the ISS enter an uncontrolled re-entry? It is highly unlikely if it's going to hit any populated area in the picture. 
and that picture is gonna be a horrible mess. I'm gonna show you a simulation I made of it. It's gonna look something along these lines here. 